Okay, good morning everyone again and welcome to the September 2013 Volunteer Match Solutions Best Practice Network webinar, Engaging the Millennial Workforce. My name is Lauren Wagner and I'm the, vol or, excuse me, I'm the Business Development Manager here at Volunteer Match and I'll be helping to facilitate today's session. So just a few housekeeping items to go through before we get started. Um, we're going to hold some time at the end of today's session to have a Q&A with the presenters. So we ask you to go ahead and submit your questions throughout the presentation this morning um, so that we can compile those and then present them at the end. There are two different ways that you can ask questions. The first way is by typing them into the question box on the right side of your screen. And the second is through Twitter by tweeting to at VM underscore solutions using the hashtag VMBPN. So again, we'll compile all of your great questions as we're going through the presentation this morning and then pose them to the presenters at the end. Also, uh, just a reminder that a copy of the slides from this morning's webinar as well as a link to the recording will be circulated after the event. So you will have all of this great information to refer back to afterwards. So engaging the millennial workforce, this morning's webinar actually wraps up Millennial Month here at Volunteer Match. So if you've been following um, any of our other resources, like our blogs, you've probably noticed that we've been talking a lot about millennials. Um, a few weeks ago, we actually looked uh, through our Nonprofit Insights webinar series at the nonprofit perspective of why and how organizations can attract and engage millennial volunteers. And this morning we're going to be looking at a similar topic, but from the corporate perspective. So we'll be looking at what, why, and how of millennial engagement within your company. So first we're going to hear from Andy Savitz, who's going to be framing up the what and why of employee engagement with insights from his most recent book, Talent, Transformation, and the Triple Bottom Line, How Companies Can Leverage Human Resources to Achieve Sustainable Growth, which was published this year. He's also the author of The Triple Bottom Line, How the Best Run Companies Are Achieving Economic, Social, and Environmental Success, and How You Can Too, which was published back in 2006. So when Andy isn't busy writing books, he's a principal at Sustainable Business Strategies, which is an independent consultancy based in Boston. And there he works with both large and small companies to help them embed sustainability into their operational and employee life cycle processes. Next, we'll dive into the how with Liz Ma. And Liz is going to be pulling insights from some of Net Impact's most recent research, including the 2012 What Workers Want report, as well as some real life examples from Net Impact members. Liz is the CEO of Net Impact, which is a leading nonprofit that empowers students and professionals to use their careers to drive change in the workplace. And during her tenure there, Liz has led the organization to grow to a community of over 40,000 students and professionals that come together in over 300 volunteer chapters around the world. Um, so with such a large network, it's interesting because the organization kind of sits in this great middle ground of current and up-and-coming millennial workers. So they have access to so much, so much great information from that group. Um, so by the end of today's webinar, I hope that you walk away understanding kind of what a deeply engaged workforce looks like and why that's so important, as well as with some actionable ideas on how you can achieve this engagement within your own company. So without further ado, I'll stop talking and bring Andy Savitz on to get us started. Good morning, Andy. Hi, Lauren, and uh, I appreciate the, uh, the siren noise in the background. Oh, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> but, well, you know, uh, it sort of cues into what I wanted to start with by saying, uh, you know, today is September 11th, and, uh, you know, as we pause to remember, you know, those tragic uh, events, uh, I think uh, people felt at the time, and I think it's still true, that uh, these kinds of things uh, which apparently, you know, which sadly occur, you know, in many countries around the world in various forms, you know, innocent people being terrorized uh, and with our mortality sort of staring us in the face, I think people have begun to search, you know, for more meaning in their lives and jobs. So, you know, that was certainly a theme of 9-11, and I think that idea still carries forward today. Um, and since 9-11, uh, you know, things have sadly gotten worse. You know, the climate situation was sandy, you know, food safety problems, uh, the recent uh, stories about worker protection in the supply chain, you know, the collapse of those buildings. Uh, um, and, you know, also economically,
the, the gap has uh, widened between uh, the have time and economic have uh, continued to sort of take center stage. Um, and even the good news has got a sort of a flip side to it, you know. Um, people are getting wealthier, especially in places like China and India. Uh, China just went over $5,000 per capita, but, but it's a two-edged sword because the stress on resources is going to be all the greater. Um, in terms of millennials, you know, there's a lot of data, and Liz uh, is going to talk about some specifically, that, that show millennials care. There's a lot of, there's a data on the other side which says they don't care. That they're, you know, they're just sort of, uh, it's sort of the me generation. So you've got people saying it's the we generation, people saying it's the me generation. My sort of view on this is that it doesn't really matter. Um, because these issues are just simply going to get larger and larger on their radar screens. Um, so my two main points are, you know, companies and nonprofits and their employees are going to have to take more action. Um, <clears throat> and that those companies and individuals, well, those companies, those organizations that figure out ways to motivate their employees to take more action uh, strategically uh, can make enormous gains in their business, not only their reputation or the cost savings that come from having employees involved in environmental or uh, issues, but uh, also through increasing their motivation as as employees and as workers. Uh, so I think we're on my book slide. I'm sorry to have this in your face for so long. My publisher insists that I do it. Um, in the book, which came out last February, and is about the role of human capital, you know, my uh, volunteerism plays a pretty big role. Um, the book concludes by suggesting that strategic volunteerism can be a starting point for building the link <clears throat> between employees and sustainability. And some companies are pursuing this link between employees, engagement, and sustainability uh, very successfully. Uh, and they're looking, you know, and this takes a lot of forms uh, in the HR groups uh, trying to ensure that their corporate values and their employee values are in alignment. You know, this is the Starbucks business model, basically. They uh, look for employees that uh, share their values. Uh, because they understand that values are a very strong driving force in terms of employee motivation. So they're looking for uh, baristas in particular, you know, who have uh, been on the front lines in, in various causes and, uh, and uh, activities. So I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. So uh, Lauren, if we can go to the next slide, uh, you know, just to make sure, you know, I'm going to sort of try and frame this a little. You know, this is the triple bottom line. Uh, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, um, and I'm not going to belabor it, but it basically stands for the idea that companies are being measured, managed, and valued, not only on the basis of their economic uh, performance, but also on the basis of their environmental and social performance. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? So, you know, this is my contribution to the, the way of thinking about this, which I, I presented in my first book and, and is also used as a frame of reference in uh, talent transformation of the triple bottom line. You know, there's lots of definitions of sustainability, but I think most people get this idea that, you know, to the extent that companies or and organizations uh, find the overlap between what they're trying to accomplish business-wise or organizationally and the interest that they can do their thing uh, tends to come uh, to companies that are sort of systematically looking for these sweet spots. And, uh, you know, I, I like to talk a lot about GE's eco and healthy imagination programs, you know, PepsiCo's investment in better foods, healthier foods. Even Apple, who sort of unintentionally uh, did something quite interesting, which was reducing the amount of garbage associated with uh, listening to music. You know, I still have these gigantic components in my basement that uh, used to comprise my stereo system. Now I, I carry this little thing around in my pocket. I get to uh, 
know, same music and in just as good quality, and, uh, you know, less physical things. And 3M's a good example of a pollution prevention program. Um, so can I get the next slide? Um, so this is a fairly complicated view of what Liz and I and others in the sustainability movement have been trying to get across across the businesses, which is essentially that there's a relationship between things in the community and their engagement in the company. Uh, and by engagement, I mean not participation, but I mean the motivation and loyalty. And so you get benefits uh, at, uh, in two ways, really, from these uh, employees who are involved. One, there are direct business results. Uh, you know, and those are listed, and you'll get a copy of the slide, so I won't belabor them. And the second is indirectly through two types of employees, just uh, participating employees, those who are involved in volunteer efforts, uh, but also, interestingly, and potentially more importantly, the increased engagement of bystander employees, you know, employees who aren't involved, uh, but who are motivated by the fact that others are. And that's just a, a phenomenon that we see all the time. You know, one of my favorite volunteering stories, which is in the book, and some of you may be familiar with this, is, you know, when Timberland employees, you know, volunteer, they were leaving, and I would have asked uh, one of the other volunteers who were there full time, you know, uh, what do you need? And the guy said, well, we need boots. And at that point, 200 Timberland employees who were about to board buses to go back to the airport, you know, just took off their boots and gave them to uh, this person who was coordinating, you know, uh, some of the relief efforts. And, uh, you know, this was an incredibly motivational uh, event for the company. Uh, and I think even for people who just read about it. So. Uh, you know, there, are, there is this notion, I think, that not everyone needs to be involved, but uh, what needs to happen is that those, the efforts of people who are involved need to be sort of communicated and shared with others. Um, so can I get the next slide? Um, just to sort of reinforce what we're talking about when we talk about employee engagement, I, I use it not to mean participation, but more in the sense of the HR uh, meaning, which means, you know, and it gets measured in these annual surveys, um, you know, how to motivate uh, employees, you know, how much loyalty do they have to the organization and its goals, and, and what's their level of commitment. And of course, this is a two-way street. Um, engagement actually evolved from the idea of job satisfaction. You know, uh, a lot of people were very satisfied with their jobs. Uh, in fact, because they weren't <laughs> called on to put in a lot of effort. So companies and organizations used to measure job satisfaction. Now they measure uh, employee engagement. Can we get the next slide, please? Lauren? Yeah. So, you know, here's a, an example of employee engagement. I mean, uh, you know, you've got, uh, you know, people who are sort of, you know, motivated and see a higher purpose in what they do, um, you know, tend to put out more effort. And there's plenty of data about this. And, and uh, companies are starting to measure uh, the relationship between participating in, uh, you know, volunteerism or bringing environmental or social issues, you know, into your job uh, and the relationship to engagement. Uh, and engagement, you know, produces better business results. So that's, uh, in some sense, how I have framed the issue. And uh, <clears throat> there are uh, a number of examples in the book. Um, one of my favorites, uh, can we get the next slide? So one of my favorite examples in the book has nothing to do with millennials. Uh, but I think it's really instructive in terms of how volunteerism uh, can make a significant difference in a company's, uh, you know, business uh, opportunities. And, and this example uh, is a British telecom. Uh, 
Uh, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with them, but they're uh, you know, a very large uh, telecommunications company. Um, you know, they have about 100,000 employees, and that's down from about twice that number. And they had a volunteer program that they set up uh, called On the Bench, which is specifically designed to help people who need to uh, find other jobs to both volunteer in uh, various types of uh, services, you know, in the community or with the environment, um, as a way of both teaching them new skills, helping them find jobs, and um, eventually, hopefully, you know, moving them into new jobs. Uh, and this, they have a pretty high success rate. Um, you know, not only does this show a sort of a orientation, a compassionate orientation to the people who uh, are getting uh, laid off in these situations. But, uh, because it shows a sort of a caring, you know, there's, there's a lot of benefits to this, not only to the organizations that get the, uh, that get the volunteers, but obviously also to the company and, uh, you know, to the, to the uh, sort of uh, way that employees feel about the company. And, you know, there's a bunch of lessons in this uh, for millennial volunteerism or really any uh, age cohort. The interesting ones, I think, is that um, the company tries to match uh, workers to, you know, they make a very uh, concerted effort to match workers to organizations uh, where there are shared interests or potentially shared skill sets uh, and where there can be a sort of a, 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 an exchange of knowledge and expertise between the organization and the workers in question. Another sort of different kind of example of uh, a volunteer program that I think uh, may be extremely effective is Walmart's My Sustainability Plan. Um, Walmart is asking its workers to voluntarily uh, uh, create sustainability plans, which interestingly don't focus on the job, but focus on what they're doing in their quote unquote personal lives, whether it be in their homes or in their communities, uh, and, to, in some, and to report back you know, to the company about what they're doing. And they've, they've got thousands of people now in the company that are doing this. And the theory behind it is that uh, the, the employees that volunteer and, and do this My Sustainability Plan program um, will eventually, you know, get the relationship between things they're doing in their personal life and things they could be doing in their work life. And, uh, you know, one of the phenomena I think that this program sort of demonstrates is a breakdown uh, between people's personal lives and their work lives. Uh, this, you know, a lot of people find this regrettable, but it's sort of inevitable. You know, people work at home more and more, uh, so they bring their work home, and they also bring their personal lives to work, you know, uh, in their pockets. Uh, you know, uh, personal, you know, mobile devices have allowed, a, have in, uh, some way uh, created a sort of a breakdown between uh, work life and personal life. And, uh, you know, one of the examples, or one of the ideas that I, I put forth in the book is that, you know, we're moving from work life balance to what I call work life integration. And one of the interesting aspects of this, I think, is a value shift or a value uh, integration uh, between uh, organizations and employees such that, you know, organizations have values and many of them are trying to inculcate sustainability-based values into their workforce. At the same time, people come to work with certain values about uh, related to environmental, uh, social, and community issues. And so there's, I think, going to be more and more of an integration of these values and to some degree a sort of a synergistic impact between what organizations are trying to advance and what individuals bring to work. This is, I think, especially true in the millennial generation where, you know, people are simply not used to, uh, you know, checking 
their values at the door, much less their music selections or you know their Facebook pages. Um, you know, and values alignment can be a very powerful uh, motivator. Uh, again, I think Starbucks is the uh, sort of the best example of this. And uh, I'm running out of time, so I won't belabor the Starbucks example. But uh, you know, trust me when I tell you that motivating their baristas and their employees is central to their their whole business model. You know, when you go on the Starbucks hiring website, you know, you see a lot about uh, fair trade, ethical sourcing of coffee, uh, community-based issues, this program where they're trying to raise money and lend it to local small businesses. Uh, and these are the kinds of values that attract people that Starbucks is looking for and it keeps them motivated, you know, uh, behind the counter. Um, so with that, I just want to say that, you know, uh, organizations like Volunteer Match and uh, what they're offering in terms of volunteer match solutions, I think, is a very important aspect of uh, sustainability. Uh, and uh, you know, I'm very happy to be on the panel with Liz, who uh, you know is really a visionary and a leader in this space. You know, net impact. Uh, you know, it's really, I mean, the growth of that organization and the uh, the inspiration that it brings to the members and the members in turn to the companies, I think, is, is really unbelievable. And, uh, and it shows the sort of the relationship between personal and organizational efforts. Uh, so I think I'll turn it back over to Lauren, I guess, and then uh, we'll hear from Liz, who's got a lot more sort of specific data about how this is working within her organization. Do we have Liz on the call? Yeah. Should I do ah, there you are. Wonderful. OK, great. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for spending time with Lauren and Andy and myself this morning or this afternoon. I'm really excited to talk to you all today about engaging millennials at work. Um, just so everyone's on the same page, when we say millennial, we're talking about the same thing as Gen Y, which is another name you hear a lot about. You might hear .NET, too. There's a number of different terms. We're basically talking about people in their 20s up to about 32 or so. Um, and so I'm sure you guys work with lots of millennials since they are fast becoming the dominant force in the workforce. Um, there are stats that show in the next 10 years the majority of the workers worldwide are going to be millennials. So this is a big generation that um, you probably are a millennial or definitely work closely to one. Um, and as you all, I, I know, will agree with, you've, you've heard from Andy as well, millennials have a lot of really interesting characteristics. I think some of those come from just being young, uh, and some of those are probably defined by the era that these millennials have grown up on. Um, Andy already mentioned September 11th being a big defining moment for young people, and clearly technology is also driving that generation forward in different ways than the Xers and the boomers before them. One of the characteristics that we at Net Impact are so excited about is that we, we see, as Andy said, a real alignment of values uh, in the personal life and the home life. And we think this can be used to our advantage as people who care about volunteerism and sustainability. And we think millennials are going to bring those expectations to work um, and be a little bit different than the generations before them. So what I'm going to cover today um, is a little bit about Net Impact and then some data from some of the studies we've done in the past that talk about millennials and other generations and employee engagement, um, and then also talk about a few great case studies from companies we work with on how they're engaging their workforce around citizenship, CSR, and sustainability. So next slide. Um, so many of you might have heard of Net Impact, but just a little bit about us as we get started. Um, we're really focused on running programs that inspire young people to change the world. We want them to be hopeful and optimistic, not resigned, and despairing at the problems in front of them. We're also connecting young people with jobs at companies and organizations where they can bring their values to work and not leave them behind at home for the nights and weekends. And we're also focused on equipping next generation professionals to drive sustainable change from whatever their role and their position in their company. Uh, as mentioned in my intro, we work with, um, oh, okay, we can go to this slide too, but just real quick, um, we work with students throughout the world, um, as well as professionals with over 300 chapters, and um, the young people we're working with are doing just really amazing things. Um, for example, one example I'll share is our 
chapter at Bowling Green State University. Uh, it's a group of student volunteers have created an event called Friday Night Lights, where they go around and help the university conserve energy by turning out the lights in academic buildings on Friday nights. So they're volunteering every Friday night at 6.30 p.m. Um, and they've reduced uh, university energy costs over the past three years by $52,000. And so um, that really stood up to me because I don't know about you all, but I was not doing that kind of thing on Friday nights when I was in college. So I do think that this generation is really poised to take things above and beyond where previous generations might have. Um, this slide we're on now, slide 16, shows our growth over the last decade. Um, what you can see here is we've grown a lot um, with our membership uh, tripling and our chapters really exploding all over the world. Those are all volunteer-led chapters locally that our central office supports. Um, our conference, which hopefully some of you have been to or will come to um, this year in San Jose at the end of October, is a truly awesome event. Um, probably one of the biggest in the world on issues related to sustainability and citizenship and just a really inspiring few days, um, which is predominantly grad students and next-gen professionals really excited about world-changing ideas. We've also really grown the number of corporate partners that we've worked with, um, working with them on everything from engaging students on campus to engaging our audience at our conference to working on employee engagement-related projects in their company. So moving to the next slide, um, Net, Net Impact also, in addition to working directly with young people, has a number of research priorities that we focus on in order to help advance the conversation around young people and sustainability and making a difference through their careers. So here you see a number of our different current research questions. Um, we're looking at commitment that millennials really have to impact jobs in relation to other priorities, uh, and how can that information better Im uh, entail corporate responsibility programs to lead to recruiting success. We want the great work that many of you all are doing with volunteerism to really pay off in terms of the kind of caliber of person who's going to come work at your company. And then we also are really interested in employee engagement. So once, once people are in the companies, are they more likely to stay if there's a great volunteer program or a green team program? Um, and how can we show that better through data? So we have some data I'm about to share with you, and then we have other um, open research questions that we're hoping to work on over the next year. And I would especially love to hear from those on the phone if they're interested in engaging in what those research projects might look like or willing to partner with us and let us survey people at your company as well. So please keep that in mind. Let's go to the next slide. Um, this slide um, is, is from our What Workers Want report that is on our website, and I would highly suggest that you check it out. If you can't find it, send me an email. Um, it was released last spring. Um, but, but I'm just going to show us two highlights from this, one of which is that in surveying college and grad students throughout the country, the majority say that not only do they want to make a social or environmental impact through their work, but they actually expect this. This is the new normal. They, they think that they're going to be able to come to work and bring their values to work and be able to make a change. Um, one thing that we thought was interesting was that there was a little bit of split here between young people from students who thought they would do this immediately in the next five years, and others who think they might sort of postpone that to later in life. So for us at Net Impact, we think they should all be doing this um, in the next five years and figure out how to work at companies that are going to let them volunteer and make a difference. And so we're, we're interested in poking a little bit more into that, those um, data points and figuring out why people think that they might want to wait until later. Let's go to the next slide. Um, an, an, a more recent study we did just last fall, we surveyed, this was just MBA students, um, not just Net Impact members, but broader MBA students in our universities that we serve, hundreds of universities were surveyed for this data. Um, and as you can see, 85% said they would take a 15% pay cut to work for an organization whose values match their own. So um, I know when I was in business school now over 10 years ago, this number probably would have been more like 20%. So we have seen a huge increase in MBAs and other kinds of grad students who are excited about working where they feel like their values are going to be recognized and they can make that more part of their experience in their day job. The next data talks about current employees, and gosh, I really wish I had read Andy's book before we did this survey, because we did survey on employee satisfaction. And I think his point that satisfaction is not as powerful as engagement is a really good one. Um, so you can take this data um, as you will, but I still think it's, it's fairly positive and interesting to note. So we, we asked people how satisfied they were with their current job. Um, this was people in their 20s, but also Xers and Boomers. So this was the workforce um, across the board. 
And as you can see on the slide here, half of those who said that they are making a positive social environmental impact at their work are very satisfied with their jobs. Um, and then 26% of those who do not have an opportunity to make this kind of difference at work are, are satisfied, very satisfied. So it's almost two to one in terms of the, the high level of satisfaction with their work in compare, comparing employees who feel like they do have an opportunity to drive positive social and environmental change at work and those who don't. Just drilling down into that data a little bit more, um, if you, what you can see here is the blue bars are, are people who have done the activities on the left. So for example, the first one is about 45% of these employees who have volunteered with their company or coworkers um, are very satisfied compared to 30% who have not, not volunteered. So again, digging down into all this data, employees who are volunteered are more satisfied, um, who've worked on products or services with social environmental impact who contributed to green teams, and who provided input into corporate responsibility efforts as well. So there has been a lot in the media about millennials, and I'm sure that you have seen a lot of it. Um, some of it is very positive, as, as Andy mentioned. For example, they have been called technologically brilliant, uh, very diverse, highly social, um, very optimistic, and very interested in world change. And, and really interested in social and environmental activities. At the same time, uh, there have been other traits that have been surfaced um, that are perhaps a little bit less positive. They have a short attention span. Uh, they are um, perhaps a little bit focused on themselves, as this Time Magazine pointed out. Uh, they might be a little bit too empowered for other people's tastes. But whatever your personal opinions or confusions are about this generation, I know you agree that they're critical to figure out how to best engage as employees as well as, of course, customers. Um, and what we at Net Impact have been focused on is really looking at the best ways to do that in our corporate partners. One of the things that we think are that there are a lot of similarities between nurturing this next generation of millennials and growing a garden. Both will take cultivation and patience and trial and error. And if you go to the next slide, uh, millennials are going to grow in your garden, regardless of what you do. Um, so either you can close your eyes and just hope for the best, or moving to the next slide, you can put resources in place to help them flourish in a way that works best for them, for you, and your company. Moving to the next slide now, I wanted to offer some different examples of how companies are investing in next-gen employees. Um, so one of the things that we've seen has worked really well is creating time and space for employees to advise millennials. Uh, so as one example, at Patagonia, they have a sustainability department that works on both environmental and social issues. And they really see themselves as, as internal consultants. So they'll have you know, passionate young employees come to them and say, hey, we have this idea, but we have no idea how to do that. Um, and the employees in the CSR department will help hook them up with answers via their own internal knowledge or through a network of contacts. A similar example on mentorship is from AT&T. What they've done there is created a mentorship circle for millennials and older mentors. Um, this is based on an online platform so that one older mentor can work with several different mentees, often in different locations, and share thoughts and advice. I'm sure, um, I'm sure also what's going on there is some reverse mentoring for the older mentor because millennials clearly have so much to offer that person as well. So this is a really win-win program for, for AT&T. There's a number of different trainings that have also come into the space about everything from volunteerism to environmental sustainability. Net Impact has our own, which we call our Impact at Workshop, which is a, a short workshop really designed for young employees to understand basics of communication and forming teams and project management. I'd be happy to talk to anyone on the phone about that workshop and how you can bring it to your company. Uh, there have been other, other examples we've heard, and I'm sure people on the phone have used some as well. Uh, Johnson & Johnson, I know, offers a certification to employees that's open to the entire company. That one's a little more based on environmental sustainability, I believe, but it's um, been a great success for them, entirely online and interactive, and employees have really enjoyed getting a formal certification to add to their belt um, through their company there. So job swaps, I think, are something really innovative and new that I've heard a number of companies do in recent years as well. Intel, for example, has a pilot program where they have carved out 20% of time 
um, 20 percent jobs and and core business units have signed up to host them. So this isn't in the CSR department, but it might be in the IT department. Employees all over the company will apply to these 20% projects after getting permission from their manager and ask to spend 20% of their time on some kind of citizenship or sustainability project related to that department. So for IT, for example, the, the position that they opened is focused on paper use reduction. Um, that program was just in pilot stage last year, and they are um, they tell me that's gone really well, and they're hoping to roll it out to more business units in the next year. So seed funding is another example of a way a number of companies are trying to inspire and empower their younger employees to get projects done. Um, Intel has a seed funding program as well. Um, 3M talked to me recently about what they are um, are calling a sustainability power pitch which they told me was a cross between Shark Tank and American Idol. And I haven't seen Shark Tank, but um, maybe someone on the phone has and can uh, share later in the comment section what that's like. Um, but what they do is they have challenged our community to give pitch ideas for what kinds of projects or what kind of products they should be doing next in terms of social and environmental impact. They have a panel of judges, and the employees are going to be able to vote, of course, by text message on which project or product they think should be funding to go forward. So I want to offer a couple more case studies on some companies that have really gotten creative with how they've been engaging their millennial employees at the office. Um, some of these are more environmental than volunteer, but I think they have lessons that can be drawn from people who are focused on volunteering as well. Um, so here on slide 26, these photos are of employees at Levi's who recently, last spring, participated in the company's Go Waterless Challenge. Um, Perhaps you've seen or heard of their Go Waterless denim products, which they've launched in the store. Water is a huge priority for Levi's, and they are trying to identify ways that they can reduce the water footprint of their product. Um, as they've done different life cycle assessments, they've noticed that most of the water use actually comes not from the manufacturing of jeans, but after the jeans have landed in the consumer's home and consumers wash their jeans. So in response to that, Levi's decided to do a major campaign to ask, ask folks to wash their jeans a little bit less and do better to engage with that than their actual employees. Um, so they challenged employees to wear the exact same pair of jeans for five days without washing the jeans. Um, and if you can look in the pictures, you might see a little white circle on two of the, the male's uh, belt buckle. And what that is is a sponge. So that's to know if they cheated or not. Because of course, if you wash your jeans with a sponge, it's going to inflate. Um, so employees love this. They sent in pictures of themselves every day via Instagram, um, and thus were sharing their progress with their social networks as well. Employees were judged not just on their ability to wear the same pair of jeans for five days in a row, which frankly I don't know if I could do, um, but they also were judged on their fashion sense. So it became a really great fashion contest as well. Um, this was a really big hit on social media for the employees. They had over 10,000 views of uh, over 5,000 images that were submitted by employees, um, and there were different folks who were judged by the Levi's high product design fashion people, and the winners were unable to give a grant to a nonprofit of their choice. Um, so again, a really fun way to engage employees on something that was very personal. Can't get more personal than the clothes you wear. They took advantage of their own um, technology tools and social networks, um, and also was really fitting with the, the fun spirit of the Levi's company, too. So the next example um, on this side is, is Patagonia, which um, really takes volunteerism to the next level. They offer employees two months to go volunteer at the organization of their choice. Um, and that might seem like a really long time. <laughs> I mean, I know none of us want to lose our employees for two months. Um, but what they told me is the employees come back so incredibly motivated and refreshed and energized that even when they decided to reevaluate the program, it was the manager who said, no, 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 keep letting my employees do this. We love the way it, it really engages employees with our company and brings them back full of passion and new ideas um, for our environmental initiatives and for our company as a whole. Um, so even, you know, even something that um, amazing with two months of volunteer time can have positive payoff for the company as well. Uh, my final example on the next slide is um, from Unilever Australia. Um, they wanted to launch their own version of Unilever Sustainable Living Plan, 
And to do that, they said, well, how, how are we really going to empower our employees to make the sustainable living plan our own? And they said, well, let's give them the title. Um, so all the employees walked into their office one day, and on their desk, they each had a personalized business card that said, Head of Sustainability. In addition, they put these great posters up all around the office, including one of the receptionists right, right by the reception desk so that all the visitors to their office would come in and they would say, hey, you're the head of sustainability, what does that mean? Um, so clearly uh, that was a really amazing way to make everyone feel personal empowerment and personal engagement with their sustainability plan. They followed this up um, with, with more meaty resources as well. They had a big, big meetings with the leadership. They had a um, sustainability kit that they put together and trainings as well. Um, and so they were able to make this definitely a big part of the employee experience for that year. They tell me that this is still a part of the vernacular at their office where they'll overhear employees saying, oh, well, I'm the new head of the sustainability, so as that, here's what I would do about that particular problem. Um, so that, that was a really neat example of how to really give, give voice to the company, to the employees around social and environmental issues. Um, so just in, in wrap up, and then I am excited to hear your questions and comments at the end about how you've been engaging your millennial employees. Um, millennials, you know, really want to be engaged. Uh, I'm sure that you know that. I'm sure they are hounding you for opportunities to be engaged. Um, and you know, I think that they want this to be a part of their work life, not necessarily because they're they're nicer or more compassionate than us older folks, um, but because the magnitude of what they're faced with in their future. Is, is really scary if you think about it. Um, I'll, I'll never forget the millennial staff person that, that we had who, who came in to me one day and told me that um, you know, she wakes up in the middle of the night worried about the world. So you know, when I was 23, I wasn't worried about that in the middle of the night. Uh, and I think that this generation with the different kinds of issues and the inequality and climate change have a really, really hard time in front of them. So, in order to, to sort of go forward, they really need to feel like the opportunity to make a difference is integrated into their everyday job, and they will be filled with pride and themselves and their companies and stay longer and be more engaged if that becomes a possibility. I know it's not easy. I often hear from folks like you that, oh my gosh, I just don't have time. How can I possibly add a, you know, another big employee engagement project to my list? Um, but I think it is critical for all of us to take time to to get these millennials started and to help them succeed. If you want to go back to my, my beautiful flower example a few slides ago, um, flowers don't grow by themselves, at least not you know, nice flowers you really want in your garden. They're going to need the right soil and conditions and gardener. And that's what all of our job is, who are, who are you know, Xers and Boomers a little bit ahead of this next generation. We need to help cultivate these millennials to be sustainability advocates. Um, and that will be far worth it for all of us as well as for them. So thanks, and I think, Lauren, we're open for questions now. Great. Thanks so much. Um, so we have a few questions that came in from, um, from the audience as we were going through. Um, and since we have Liz fresh and, and ready to talk, we'll start with one for you. Um, so one of the questions we got about the what workers want research was surrounding whether the research looked at whether millennials prefer or have any kind of um, feelings about monetary giving versus volunteerism, and if any of those kind of um, differences came up. And if not, if you do have any insights into um, preferences in the millennial generation around monetary versus volunteerism. Yeah. Um, so what workers want, we have a great executive summary on our website, and we have a great infographic as well. Um, I'm happy to send those out to people. My email um, was on the last slide, so it'll come through in the presentation. Um, but yes, we did ask that question, and we found that millennials do prefer to volunteer over give money. We actually have data for the Xers and the Boomers as well. So if, if that person wants to email me, I can point you to the exact data we have on millennials and their, their preference for volunteering versus, versus donations of money. Great. 
Thank you. Um, yeah, and just to remind everybody, you will be getting a copy of the slides, so, um, and Liz's information is in there as well as Andy's, so if you have any questions um, directly for either of the presenters, you can also follow up with them. Um, and I also forgot to mention again that um, you can still ask her questions. We have a few minutes to go through them, so if you have any more that you'd like to submit, um, you can submit them through the question box or through Twitter, um, and we'll make sure to try to get to those. Anything we don't get to as well, um, we'll make sure to send to the presenters afterwards. So the next question is actually for both Andy and Liz. Um, so you both brought up kind of this idea of tapping into uh, the values of your employees. So, you know, with the fact that there's kind of less of a line between, okay, well, my values at home are different than my values at work. Um, you know, Andy talked about it with the work-life integration. Um, Liz, you talked about it with, you know, your staff about how millennials expect to make a difference at work. Um, and so with kind of the diverse nature of millennials and that group, how or what would be kind of the best way to tap into such a varied set of values and, and to make sure that you're kind of allowing all of your employees to engage their own passions and own values while they're at work? Well, I, don't know I, have, a, I have a good example from PricewaterhouseCoopers where I was a partner for a number of years. Uh, I think they're doing a fabulous job at this. And one of the things they started doing was uh, <clears throat> when they went to job fairs, and, you know, they have to hire, you know, several thousand young uh, newly trained accountants every year. Uh, they stopped giving out rubber balls and uh, little knickknacks that said PWC, and instead they asked everybody who came to the booth uh, uh, what was their favorite charity and they would donate five dollars on behalf of that individual to their to the organization of their choice which gave them a lot of insight uh, into you know what kind of volunteer programs to set up and uh, what kind of charitable giving to do both as an organization and then if some of these people joined the firm they had a running start on knowing how to design programs that spoke to their interests yeah, that's, that's a great example. Um, yeah, I would just add to that that there are a number of companies who've had a lot of success with enabling employees to um, give out small grants to nonprofits of their choice, so whether it's by it's all employees voting or some sort of smaller, more engaged committee, but um, that's worked really well for a number of companies to sort of carving off some of that foundation money for employee, direct employee decision making. Great. Yeah, I love those examples. I love the, the PricewaterhouseCoopers example where you're actually getting them engaged while, or getting them participating and engaged while actually learning more about what they're interested in. That's great. Um, so while we kind of are on the topic of measuring and, and surveying your employees, um, how, and this is again a question for both of you, how are people measuring engagement? You know, not just participation, as Andy mentioned, you know, but that true kind of deep engagement. You can see it, again, with Andy's example of um, Timberland and employees giving their boots right off their feet. I mean, obviously, those employees are committed and engaged and passionate. But how do you measure your employees taking off their boots and giving them to somebody who needs them? Well, this is really and a human resources and HR expertise. And one of the things I encourage people to do on the call is to meet with their HR counterparts who can explain to them in probably in pretty good detail how this is done. You can also go to the Gallup, you know, everyone knows about the Gallup polls. Well, Gallup uh, polling has be for engagement has become sort of, uh, I won't say the gold standard, but uh, you can see the kinds of questions that get asked. In essence, what is happening on annual employee surveys is that um, certain questions are designed to uh, get at the issue of engagement. And companies can measure it very specifically now. Uh, and it tends to be, you know, would you leave this job for another job that paid the same? Uh, would you uh, recommend our company or organization to others. 
you know, these questions are designed to measure loyalty, commitment, and there are other questions designed to measure motivation. Uh, a couple of companies that I've been working with uh, have been measuring specifically, you know, what Liz is talking about in terms of whether or not, you know, volunteering and other things are correlated positively to these measures of engagement. So that's more or less how it's being uh, done. They ask questions, and then they see the kind of core, whether those questions correlate to higher engagement scores based on the engagement style questions. And one interesting phenomenon is that bystander employees are being uh, are more are motivated by the fact that their colleagues are doing great things, and you know, Timberland is a good example of that. And this is a little bit theoretical, but um, many engaged employees come to companies with a higher level of commitment to these things. And so when you measure their engagement, it's sort of circular, because uh, they started with engagement, and now they're being tagged as more engaged employees. But the bystanders aren't. The bystanders are not engaged themselves, uh, but they are high, more motivated. I, I should say they're not participating themselves, but they're more motivated and more engaged on the basis of other employees' participation. So I, I think that's a pretty interesting dynamic. Great. Thank you, Andy. Um, Liz, did you have anything that you wanted to add to that? That was a fantastic answer. Um, I would also add that I know a number of uh, colleagues who have been laboring really hard to get specific sustainability and volunteerism related questions into their annual employee surveys to directly ask about whether employees care about this or their involvement. And that um, it sounds like that is usually an effort to get <laughs> questions to add into the official survey. But um, I have a couple of examples of those questions if that would be useful for anyone to see. Great, thank you. Yeah, maybe we can include that in um, the follow-up after the presentation this morning. Sure. Um, so we have a few more minutes left, and I always like to kind of end things with a final thought. So um, Andy and Liz, if each of you could offer kind of your final thought for people to walk away with or the most important kind of piece of information that you'd want people to, to leave the webinar with this morning. Well, I'll go first because Liz usually has much more practical advice than I do and uh, is more directly connected to this. But uh, I think my takeaway would be uh, that those who are involved in the volunteer programs of their companies should really coordinate with their human resource counterparts to understand whether and how volunteering uh, in all its forms, is related to this idea of commitment, loyalty, and motivation. Because that really can show a business case for this. Uh, because if you have a more highly motivated workforce because of your efforts, uh, that translates into higher customer satisfaction, higher productivity, less absenteeism, reduced hiring costs because your engaged employees are you know, helping you find other good people. Uh, there's tremendous amounts of hard and soft business benefits that come from increased employee in engagement. So to the extent that you can connect your programs through data to employee engagement, you're, you're making a pretty strong business case for it. There's an intuitive case, but there's now starting to, a quantitative case is also beginning to emerge. Yeah, and uh, I will say that Andy's book is a great primer if you haven't worked with, much with HR to, to get you familiar with the concepts and the kinds of examples and themes you could bring. So keep that in mind. Um, and then I guess I'll, I'll just add that I can pretty much guarantee you that somewhere in your company you've got at least one, if not a dozen, gung-ho young people who would gladly give up their you know, night times and lunch hours to help you figure out how to engage their peers. So if you haven't already engaged volunteers to help manage the volunteers, um, I'm sure that you could find some awesome people who would love to help you um, figure out the right way to do more to engage young people at your company. 
So just to, uh, you can seek them out through word of mouth or through holding a brown bag and just you know sending out an email, and I can guarantee you they'll come to you and be really thrilled to get involved. Wonderful. Thank you both so much for the final thoughts. Um, you know, just to kind of pull a little bit off of what Andy was saying, um, I always found it interesting. I've been with Volunteer Match for four years, and um, you know, for the first three, almost, you know, and through now. I mean, recently is just the time I'm starting to see it pick up. But I've always been, or I was always kind of surprised that the volunteer programs sat more in, you know, a marketing or you know solely public affairs or community relations department with little, um, if any, kind of crossover into HR. And I'm seeing a lot more of you know the people that I'm speaking with being uh, part of this HR or, or part of an HR function because people are really starting to see how having these type of engagement programs really does benefit your company from a human resources perspective in attracting and retaining that talent. So it's nice to kind of continue to see that um, kind of coming to light with people and, and, and being talked about. So it's great. So I think we're just about up with the hour this morning. But um, I wanted to, first of all, thank everybody for being on the call. And thank you to Andy and Liz for sharing your insights and, and your research with us. Um, there are def definitely other ways, you know, aside from our webinars, that you can stay informed and up to date with kind of the most recent trends in CSR and volunteering um, on our blog, volunteering at csr.org. Um, you can follow us on Twitter at VM underscore solutions. And I would also encourage people to sign up for our monthly Good Companies newsletter, which you can sign up for on our blog. Um, and the last thing I'll leave you with is the save the date for the October uh, Best Practice Network webinar where we'll be talking about skills-based volunteerism with Danielle Hawley from Common Impact and Laura, Laura Hamry from Fidelity Investment. So that registration is up and ready to go, and we hope to see you all again in October. So thanks again to Andy and Liz, and we'll talk to you all soon. Thank you. Our pleasure. Thank Bye -bye. you so much. Bye. Bye.